are about to witness the very exciting story of a city and its people. It will be an adventure that will open new sights in familiar surroundings. It is a story of a city seeking new horizons in a resolute contest with great challenges. That city is Detroit, home of nearly two million people. Back in 1701, Long before this land became a nation, Cadillac planted the colors of France on Detroit's shore. And thus began a rich and inspiring history which has brought Detroit to its finest hour. celebrating 100 years. Um, we'd also like to thank everybody who's participating today, uh, all of our speakers. We will have Judge Reardon, Judge Rosen will be here later today. Um, the deputy mayor is here, so thank you to everyone who's participating. Thank you to everyone who came out and is supporting this event. Um, today we're focusing on the city the Larvey has called home for the past 100 years. Uh, the city of Detroit, we're focusing on the past and the recent present events and looking ahead to the future and what could be expected as future legal issues that our own law reviewers here might be writing about in 10 to 20 years. So thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce the um, dean of our law school, Dean Crocker, to say a few words and we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. I have the privilege of being the dean of this great law school, and events like this are one of the things that just make me so proud and pleased to be here. So as Catherine said, Detroit Mercy Law has been located in the heart of Detroit since it opened in 1912. And the law school, or I'm sorry, the law review started in 1916. It is one of the oldest law reviews in the country. On the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the Law Review, Talbot Smith, who was the Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, made remarks that hold true today. He said, ours is a complex and hurried society. We have progressed with tremendous strides in recent years. As a result, both the bench and bar are confronted with legal and factual problems of vast complexity. The press of the docket says, hurry on. Justice herself says, to wait, to be sure. To our aid, increasingly relied upon, come the law reviews with their scholarly objective analysis of the law. We of the profession are greatly in their debt. This symposium is an excellent example of how the Det University of Detroit Mercy Law Review has done just that throughout its history, providing a forum for the scholarly objective analysis of legal issues facing the city of Detroit and other major cities throughout this country. We owe a special thanks to director and editor of this centennial symposium, Catherine Ross. Where did she go? Others have worked hard on this symposium who also deserve our thanks. Associate Dean for Student Affairs, Megan Jennings. <laughs> Assistant Director for Student Affairs, Shamila Khan, who's probably off doing something. And faculty advisor to the Law Review, Professor Julia Bellion. I'd also like to acknowledge and applaud the editor in chief of the Law Review, Nina Gramlovic, 
online editor Ben Stoltman, and all the members of the Law Review this year who have carried on our long tradition of excellence. Thank you. And Nina, please. Thank you. <laughs> I next have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, Deputy Mayor of Detroit, Isaiah Ike McKinnon. Mayor McKinnon has a bachelor's degree from University of Detroit, a master's in criminal justice from Mercy College, a PhD in higher education administration from Michigan State, and he graduated from the FBI Academy in Quantico. Mayor McKinnon has served the people of Detroit throughout his life. He served on the Detroit Police Department for 19 years, and returned to be the chief of police from 1994 to 1998 under Dennis, I'm sorry, under Mayor Dennis Archer. Prior to becoming deputy mayor, he was an associate professor of education here at the University of Detroit Mercy. He's now on leave to serve as deputy mayor. We greatly appreciate his service to the current administration. We look forward to his return to the faculty. And we are honored that he's here with us this morning. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Mayor McKinnon. Thank you, Dean, and good morning to everyone. I usually don't dress this way. I, I'm on my way to uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, my wife is there. She was in Sedona for a week, and so. Uh, I have to go and join her to go and visit some of our money that we've left out there throughout the years. Um, my, my youngest son uh, attended UNLV and um, he was there for six years. And during that six year period, we would go two or three times a year to visit Jason. And now he's back home. And we fell in love with going out to see some of the shows, as everybody will tell you. Uh, but that's the biggest lie people tell you. If you go out to see some of the shows, we're going to go and gamble. So, but it's just a pleasure to be here today. I um, that's my time to go. <laughs> it's um, I, I truly enjoy being a part of what's going on in Detroit. Uh, probably the oldest person in the room I am, and I uh, watch this growth and the, the the apex, the zenith, the decline since 1953. In 1953, we had a 99 and a half percent occupancy rate in, uh, in our city. I recall that specifically because my parents were trying to find a place to, uh, to live. And we couldn't find a place, so we had to move to the Brewster Projects. The Brewster Projects is infamous for a number of reasons, but some people think of it as Diana Ross's home uh, and some other, Joe Lewis and others who lived there. I lived in the Brewster Projects. So 99% occupancy and all the other things that were going on in the city. But there were some other uh, very serious problems and concerns. So what I'm going to do is we say past, present, and what we're doing right now. I'm going to take you on my little ride, uh, my uh, 72 years of, of uh, age, and the things that I've seen, and in, in, in particular, the good and the bad, and probably some of the ugly, too. In 1957, uh, I uh, joined, uh, was a started Cass Tech High School. And at that time, Cass Tech was seen as uh, probably the best uh, school, certainly in the state, and I think it was ranked as the second best school in, in the country. So I was proud of that. Now, before that, I attended this school called Garfield Elementary. And uh, my favorite teacher, uh, who I'm still in contact with, Mr. Raymond Hughes, he's 91 years old, and we still maintain contact. He's, he's, he takes uh, credit for my rise. So <laughs> and I said, that's really, that's really good. Anyway, so that first day of school in 1957, back in those days, it was uh, a half day for high school people. And so I went back after that, to, during that first half, to go back to uh, see Mr. Hughes at uh, Garfield Junior High School. Never to know that that would be a, a point that would change my life forever. 
And so I went to the school, and as I was leaving at about two something, I stepped out of the school and was walking down the street. And I should tell you, at that time, I was 14, about 5'11", maybe 170 pounds or so. And I'm walking down the street, and I was uh, stopped and grabbed by these uh, Detroit police officers. And uh, my interaction with police had been nothing. Uh, I had not, never had any interaction whatsoever. And so as I walked and, and these guys grabbed me, uh, they uh, threw me up against the car and proceeded to uh, call me names and proceeded to beat me. At 14 years of age, I'm being beaten by the Detroit police. And the name calling and things and everything else that one could imagine so I can remember this specifically, it's a bright sunny day and I'm looking around for and I'm saying, sir, please, please, please. And the more I yell, the more they beat. And I uh, remember looking out at the crowd and no one came to my aid. And after they finished beating me in the name calling, they told me to get my ass out of there. So I ran home. I didn't tell my parents because in 1957 is a different time. It's certainly different than one could ever imagine. You're not old enough to recall that. But I didn't tell anyone. But I made myself a promise that evening that I would become a Detroit police officer. And the reason I was going to become a Detroit police officer is that I wanted to make sure that those kinds of things did not occur to me, to others around me, and so forth. It wasn't specific to me as a young African-American male, but I thought that those guys were bad. But I'd also seen other guys do things, that, police officers do things that were despicable. And so, Again, not telling my parents, not telling anyone else. When I went to the military in 1961, I served four years. My last year and a day being in Vietnam. And I kept that promise to myself that I was going to join the police department. I joined the Detroit Police Department in 1965. And <clears throat> my first day at the, uh, the second precinct, now think about this now. This is a few years after 1957. 1965, I'm thinking that everything was... Uh, going to be good. And the, the law enforcement code of ethics says this in the first paragraph. As a law enforcement officer, my fundamental duty is to serve the community, to safeguard lives and property, to protect the innocent against deception, the weak against oppression and intimidation, to respect the constitutional rights of all to liberty, equality, and justice. And he goes on and on and on. But I, I read that, and we had to remember that. And I said, boy, this is really something. So my assumption was that uh, the, 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 the police officers, like the ones who beat me up, would be gone. So I walked into roll call that first day, night, it was midnight. And I happened to be the only minority there. As I did so, uh, no one spoke to me. I go, okay. So the uh, sergeant comes up and he says, roll call. And as he does so, I line up the, the last person in line because I'm the youngest and newest person there. And uh, he starts calling names. Let's say Smith and Jones, you scout 2 1, so and so 2 2, and he gets it to scout 2 7. And uh, he says, This person's name, who I still remember, he says McKinnon 2 7. And at that point, the officer said to me, Excuse my language, he says, Jesus fucking Christ, I'm working with the nigger. This is at roll call. And so I went back to 1957 for what had occurred to me then. And I said, my God, it hasn't changed. And so I had to live through that, and others had to live through that at that time. And my question was, what's happening to our city if officers are, are uh, acting this way at roll call to me after they had beat me up in 1957? What is the attitude of police in our city? And so it became even more of a, a task of me to make a difference. And I would talk to other officers, whether they were uh, African American or Hispanic, they suffered the same kinds of indignities. And it became even more imperative to do those kinds of things. And so, um, we survived through that. And in 1967, we had the, 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 the rebellion, the riot, whatever one wants to call it. And the second day of the riot, uh, I was coming home from uh, my duty station at the 2nd Precinct, and I'm driving down the street in my uniform, 
and I had my top down in my 1965 black over green Mustang convertible, <laughs> which was a great car. I wish I'd never got rid of it, Roy. But I, <laughs> anyway, so I'm driving down Boston Avenue, I'm sorry, Chicago Avenue, and these two uh, police officers pulled me over. And as they did so, I said, police, police, I'm in my uniform. And they said, tonight you're going to die together. And they shot at me. And I dove into my car, and I sped away as they shot at me. Now, I'm telling you all this because this sets a background or a tone for things that's happened in our city. If the police are doing, and I'm saying, not saying all, if the police are doing what they should be doing, and they treat the police that way, and people in the city, what's the attitude that they contribute to our city? And so doing that right, we lost 43 people, a great number. But we, we got through that. So we go back to 53, where 99% occupants, we go back to 57, 65, when I joined 67, where all these things were occurring. And at this point, the, uh, the National Guard were brought in, and things got probably worse. But as we, in the police department and other people in the city, they saw that all these things were happening to them, not just to Ike McKinnon, the police officer, but people would say to me, my God, you know, this happened to me. And so that tone was, I don't trust the police, nor do I trust the, the power structure that's in office because they don't stop them. Now as young people, you would say, my God. I think at that time too, I think it was the start of the Black Panthers, and others in the city that led to some major, major problems. So we move on into the 70s. I was a young sergeant at the, one of the precincts, and um, we started the drug trafficking in our city. It was beyond one's imagination. I saw this firsthand because I couldn't believe that people were using, because people used weed because that's, that's what they did. But we got into the hard drugs. And as the police enforced, it became more stringent in certain neighborhoods. And again, there was a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust. And also, we started getting a lot of young African-American men killed by the police. I'm there, I see this. And what do you do? So you, this, this total lack of trust. And in the community, they were saying, damn, man, they shoot all of us. Well, I said, well, let's do what I did, join the police department and make this difference. And some did, some didn't. And it became to a point where we had vigilantes within the, the African-American community who went after the police. Who went after the police. Uh, you heard of uh, Haywood Brown and those guys. It was just amazing. Because they said that the police are stealing from people and so forth. I didn't know if that was true or not. But my position was, let's make a difference and change things. Let's change the police department. Let's change the attitude of police officers because we can't change society. But if you treat people in the rest of the world like you treat me, how the hell do you expect things to change? It was very, very difficult. And so, I decided it was important for me to go back to school. And at that time, they frowned on any law enforcement officer getting a higher education. But I did that. And it was interesting for me because as I did so, um, you think about this, I spent 11 years in school. Night school, day school, driving up to Michigan State three times a week. And at some point it became difficult because those in, in the power of the police department said, uh, you know, we're going to stop you. Either openly or not so openly. This is what happened. This is what happened within our city, my city. And I said, God, we've got to make a difference here. We have to make a difference. Well, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so, 1983, Coleman Young was elected mayor of the city of Detroit. If you could have been around, those of you who are a little bit older, you know what happened, 83, 84, was uh, the disdain that Coleman Young was held in in our cities. 
I mean, the name calling. Officers, when Coleman Young started affirmative action, officers were fighting in police stations. And this became knowledgeable. So you just imagine that uh, you are a person in the city of Detroit, in particular a minority, who see police officers, black and white, fighting, pulling guns on each other in the police station. It was frightening. They were fighting at the federal building, Detroit police officers. How do we make this change? Well, Coleman Young stuck by his guns and did what he had to do, but it did not make a significant change within the city. And at some point, people started to move out of the city. Uh, and unfortunately, it was such that blacks and whites moved out of the city, middle class blacks and whites moved out of the city. Our schools suffered tremendously, tremendously. You know, in the last X number of years, we've lost 100,000 students from our city. So I'm going to fast forward to when Dennis Archer became mayor. And Dennis's position was, I, I've got to change this so that everybody will feel comfortable. And will want to move back into the city. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. We continued to lose population. We lost from a million nine to about 700,000 people. And it's not just because of the issues with policing, but it's all schooling. <laughs> The fact that we had a major crime problem, the drug issue, back in the 70s, 80s, we had a group called Young Boys Incorporated. The YBI was the most proficient group of young uh, drug people one could ever imagine. These kids, 13, 12, 13, 14 years of age, had not, probably didn't do any schooling, but I, I was in charge of the, uh, that particular area, and they were great at what they did, but they also killed people. They killed people, and it made it even worse. And so people were saying, wait a minute, I'm not going to have my kids in this city. I'm going to leave. I don't, I don't want them to go to the schools, because at the schools, they maintained control of the, some of the schools also. It was a frightening time. And no one had that under control. And so people said, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And they did. So from a million nine to 700,000 or so, as we've lost, and we went to about 50,000 vacant homes in the city by the time that Mike Duggan became mayor. It's, it was and is a frightening time. And so Mike, I'm gonna fast forward because of my time, Mike said, here's what we have to do. We have to make sure the schools are great, we have to make sure that our streets are safe, we have to make sure that these abandoned homes are taken care of, we have to make sure that uh, public transportation is great. You know, please understand, the time, um, we made 225 buses to uh, operate uh, efficiently, uh, efficiently in the city. I think we had probably 125 buses running. People couldn't get the job, and 35% of the people in Detroit didn't have cars. Didn't have cars, and a similar number didn't have driver's license. You saw the guy who walked to work uh, out to, this, this is normal. I did some consulting with Meyer when I was at the university, and they hired people. Um, and uh, it would take them three hours to get to work. And so I talked to the one, the manager of the store, he said, I, we need to get people to work. So let me explain to you what's happening in our city. We don't have the buses to do so. So that's one of the first things that Mike did, thank God for Joe Biden, he uh, got his buses, we're up over 200 now. In addition to the lights, I mean, probably 70% of the lights in our city were out. It was important to get those lights on. And we did a tremendous job of doing that. So going back to those things that happened those years, the attitudes and the fear that was there, dealing with the police, and the lack of cooperation between community and police, and the fact that uh, no one did anything about it. We had, we've had for years a sense that it's somebody else's fault. But no one would make the the strategic or the necessary calls to, to do the changes that had to be done. And it led us to a point that we have been over the last couple of years or so. Now that we're, we're you can see that there's tremendous changes is going on. Uh, I was uh, in a, a meeting um, with Gilbert uh, a month or so ago, and his position, he said this, 
<clears throat> he said, in five years, Detroit is going to be the place that people want to come to, that people want to move to. And I'm saying, thank God. You know? Well, think about that. Five years ago, people did not want to move to the city of Detroit. Now people are. The population has increased tremendously. The people, the businesses are coming not only downtown, we still get to the neighborhoods, but it's, it's, it's a tremendous change. <clears throat> Let's look at whether it's downtown, it goes all the way to Highland Park, uh, it's about 99.5% occupied. And we have to move west and east to make a difference there. It, there's, there's changes that's tremendous for all, all of us, so let's hope that we can continue to do so. Now, let's, let's start you asking questions if you do so, because I've got to go and catch this plane, so let's go. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. It might be a naive question, but why did the police department want you to advance your education? At that time, they wanted big, tough, strong guys and not to be uh, educated. You had to be big, tough, and strong to beat somebody's behind. I was big and strong. I was a black belt in karate. But uh, uh, to me, it wasn't a thing to do. And they had never had people who were educated in the police department. So when I became Dr. McKinnon in the police department, I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. My boss, he said this in a meeting. He said, Jesus fucking Christ. He said, now we have to do these reports and make sure they're right because the fucking doctor over there is going to correct them. <laughs> and I said, that's right. <laughs> it's amazing, the mindset. So you think about that mindset of people, and this, this wasn't a race issue. <laughs> this is black and white who felt that you were not one of them. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's difficult. Yes, sir? Thank you very much for sharing your story today. Um, can you suggest anything that we can do as um, non-legal professionals uh, to, to help with the growth of the city? Oh, yeah. No, number, one, number one, spread the good word. You know, because this, um, since that uh, all the bad things have been said, I was at a, at a chief's meeting uh, in uh, Florida. I'll never forget that the, the chief of Columbus, Ohio, his wife was there. And me and him and my wife are sitting down with his wife, sitting down to, to dinner. And uh, she said, so where are you from? I said, Detroit. She said, oh, God. She said, you're alive? <laughs> I said, yeah. And, and uh, she said, God, I heard all these bad things about Detroit. I said, well, there's some bad things, but you know, we have to make sure that they are not uh, spread to be not the truth. That's the biggest issue. You know, we <laughs> things happen in other cities, and the word is not spread as badly as it is in Detroit. So we, we have to make sure that we tell the truth. Of course, there are bad things, but it's not the most encompassing thing about our city. I mean, I've been here for a long time. As I said, I lived through the, the really bad times. And so uh, now that I see this, I, mean, I don't, I don't want to go, but I've got to, you know, hopefully I'll live for a few more years, you know. But this is the most important. Spread the good word. Spread the good word and tell those who, I, I've, I've talked to people who said, I haven't been to Detroit since the riot in 1967. I said, well, I live there. Why don't you come down? It's scary. I said, well, it might be scary to you. It's scary in some locations. But you've got to use good common sense. I got lost in Cabrini Green in Chicago. If you know about Caprini Green, that's an area that nobody wants to go to. I mean, well, the shootings that's going on right now, it's not there, but the same area. I got lost there. I had my wife, my two sons, and my little uh, five-shooter pistol. And so my wife, she said, you have your gun with you. I said, they have bigger and better guns. So, <laughs> so, so thank God I got out of there. But that's, you know, it's, it's a stigma that's associated with our city. Yes, Detroit, but the suburbs, and, 
And, and I guess my, my question to you is, what are you seeing in terms of uh, trends, in terms of the gains, and are you seeing things more as regional and not just focused on Detroit, not that that's necessarily better, but is, is the impact of gang violence strong in Detroit? Um, are there regional efforts to deal with what's happening in, in a more organized crime situation? There are regional efforts to do so. But please understand that the gang situation is not specific to um, Detroit because they, they start in other locations and they come to Detroit, as you know. Uh, there's a group that comes out of Mexico, that comes up through California, they come uh, out 80, and they have stations all throughout the, the country. And one of those stations is Detroit. And um, what the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney is trying to do is make sure we stop them. But, you know, look, the, the fact is this. I mean, the gangs outnumber us. <laughs> they, they outnumber us. And so what we have to do is make sure that we uh, do whatever we can to control it. You know, if you look at the prisons, uh, there are a great number of gangs that are in there, and they control things. Sonola, Sonola gangs, I mean, they, it's very, very, very popular and very powerful. So we have to keep trying to fight it. Uh, it's not as bad in Detroit as when it was YBI and the Bosselinos and those other guys who were doing those things. But YBI was probably the most powerful and deadly gang that we had uh, throughout the years. They had their tracksuits, right? Oh, God. With their little YBI on them. <laughs> uh, you know Judge Mathis, you see on the TV? Yeah. Uh, Judge Mathis, um, he'll tell this story. Um, there was this incident that occurred at uh, uh, Joe Louis Cobo, Cobo. And um, YBI, they went and they were just, they're very powerful. They're very powerful. And so Jess Mathis is running down Jefferson and I'm chasing him. So he talks about that. And he says, the Chief was chasing me down Jefferson Avenue. But I, and he says, he didn't catch me, but I caught him. So, yeah. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Do you, ma'am? They are. They, they are. And the other part of it is what they're doing is they're selling that lot to the, the, the neighbor for a dollar. Oh, yeah, they're, they're going after the owner. Now. This is what Mike said he's going to do. Oh, yeah. So this, this is interesting. This, with all these abandoned places, and of course, that's um, what our neighborhood people are doing. It's, it's amazing to see it. And no one took responsibility for it. Like do it with angels like devils like when they used to burn all the places. That's uh, right there. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the mistrust of the police going on right now and everything that we see in the news, do you think that that is starting to improve at all? <clears throat> Let me say this. I've done a lot of diversity training for law enforcement officers uh, around the country. And we have to make certain that we select the right people to carry guns, to be law enforcement officers. And we have to educate the police and the community to what's going on. When I leave this time to go back to the university, what I'm going to do is part of that is to, to do a great job of educating. I'm going to talk about 70 years of um, racism in law enforcement and the things that occurred to me and the things that I've seen and try and educate the community to what's going on. I don't know if there's ever going to be a trust of law enforcement officers because historically, and Roy will probably tell you more about this when he speaks, of the African American community and law enforcement. I don't know if there ever, ever will be a total trust, and as we see all these young people being, being uh, shot, or, and whatever the reason might be, if they're right or wrong, uh, the facts are this. We have a great number of young people who are being shot or killed, and um, uh, there, there appears to be some, something wrong there. 
and something has to be done to educate law enforcement and to make sure those in the community. I, this guy said to me, he said, did you have the, think about this, did you have the talk with your son about when you stopped by the police? Why should you have a talk with your son about when you stopped by the police? My father had that conversation with me when I was a young boy. I had that conversation with both of my sons. If you stop by the police, don't make any unusual moves, put your hands out the window of a car. You don't have to do that. It's something to think about. And if you run away from the police, you know, things might happen. Think about that with your, your children. I've had to think about that every day and thought about it with myself because I get stopped by the police as a 72-year-old man you know, who's uh, uh, deputy mayor and in other communities. Think about that. And some person who doesn't necessarily like you, doesn't necessarily trust you, or might think that you're going to do something wrong. That's important. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think that what will happen is this, that that group that moves, in, moves into the city, they will probably be separated, this is just my opinion, be separated from the group that's here. What we got to do as a city is to educate both. So listen, people moving in are not here to take over the city. They're here to make the city better. And I've had people yell and scream at me and say, uh, if those people moving into the city, uh, they try to take it over. I'm saying they are tax-paying people who can make a difference in our city. 11% tax base. It's important to have people move into the city, but you have the tensions between groups who move in. Yes, we have to continue to educate. I think education is the most important thing that we can do, but there are those who refuse to do so. I will tell you, I was at this one uh, law enforcement agency talking about diversity, and this officer showed up with a, with a swastika on his shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I looked. And of course, he's testing me, but you know, what the hell? I mean, I mean really. I mean, so he's letting me know. Another guy, he, we're, we're talking about diversity on, 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 on police departments. And I said, So, how do you handle uh, gays you know, uh, in your area? It got quiet. I said, Well, there might be gay people in your police department. And the guy says, there ain't no fucking way there's a gay on my department. I swear to you. <laughs> and the lady sitting next to him, she said, well, I'm gay. <laughs> well, very serious, very serious, very serious. She says, I'm gay. He says, hey, there ain't no fucking way you're gay. I'm going to fuck you. <laughs> I'm serious. But this is the mindset. So Bill, we have a long way to go. I listen, we've got to get together for some more conversation because I enjoy this. Uh, and another time, another place, if I'm late for my plane, y'all gonna pay. <laughs> listen, I've, I've, I've got to go and enjoy my time in Vegas with Celine Dion and some other people. So thank you for having me here this morning.